My name is Shomik Datta. I'm a musician, a Londoner, and an Indian by birth. I play the sarod, a traditional Indian instrument, and I'm passionate about all forms of music, particularly the music of my homeland. In this series, I want to go beyond the well-worn clichés and delve deep into one of the richest musical traditions anywhere in the world. India is a nation bursting with music, but it's also a country in the midst of rapid change. I'm going to travel across India and play with some of the country's best musicians to see how the history and traditions of this nation have shaped its music. From flamboyant wedding bands to enduring temple rituals. There are families here and young people, they're dressed up, flowers in their hair, it's beautiful. Folk melodies of village life to modern day hip hop chants from the slums. I want to find out how music helps you make sense of this hugely diverse country. I'm starting with some of the oldest and most traditional forms of music. Music which came from palaces and temples and these days is known as classical. It's this huge climax and bang, there's the ending. These ancient melodies underpin much of Indian culture. This music can take the most beautiful spot in your heart. I'm going to discover what this revered music tells us about India's past. Traditionally, was there a hierarchy in the musical system? Absolutely. That's where a lot of our troubles stem from. <laughs> and how it helps us understand the politics and culture of modern India. That day I cried a lot. Why there is gender bias? Music for everybody. This is Kolkata. It's where I was born and learned to play music. It's the annual festival of Kali Puja. And among the madness, Indian classical music plays a part. So there's a bit of a party going on here. This festival is all about light over darkness, the triumph of good over evil, and that idol over there, Kali, stands as a symbol of hope and power to everyone in the community. You can see all the heads that she's chopped off all the bad guys and she wears them as a garland. I love it, it's so violent. This is a Hindu festival, but like much in North India, daily life is a fusion of Hindu and Muslim cultures. And Indian music is also a blend of those different traditions. At makeshift stages across the city, musicians play a mixture of folk tunes and Bollywood hits. Classical music might seem a world apart, but it's not. This is a really famous Bollywood song, everyone knows it, but actually the melody of it is rooted in Indian classical music. People here are listening to classical music, but I don't think they even know it. In India, if you scratch beneath the surface, you'll find classical music is part of the country's everyday culture.
India is a country of two very distinct regions, the North and South, with two very different musical cultures and traditions. The North has been shaped by the legacy of Islamic conquest. Whereas the South has retained deeper connections to ancient Hindu practices. My hometown of Kolkata, capital of the state of West Bengal, is culturally part of the North. Once the capital of British India, it's now a teeming city of 14 million people. And it's one of the country's main centers for classical music. At the heart of this ancient music is a concept called the rag. It's a form that's very different to anything in Western music. Loosely translated, a rag refers to a kind of melody consisting of certain notes and set phrases around which the musician improvises. My teacher used to describe rags as being the color of music. Every color, turquoise, blue, red, maroon, orange, they make people feel a certain way. And rags do the same thing. They evoke emotions within people. Each rag has its own set of phrases, and um, these phrases define the character of the rag. I mean, the role of the musician is to interpret those phrases and make them their own. I might play a glide a bit faster today, or a bit slower tomorrow, or I might uh, add some rhythmical uh, elements to it to sort of uh, create some excitement. and might decide to go really high and then come back down again. Once the basic phrases have settled within you, you can then start mixing them with your own personality uh, to create a concert, a performance that is unique to you. This rag that I'm playing, Bengal Bilawo, it's actually quite a rare rag, but it's the last one that my, my guru who passed away, um, is the last rag that he taught me, and um, it's very close to my heart. But it also evokes, you know, the, the sense of Bengal, a sense of homeland, really. Indian classical music used to be associated with an exclusive world of privilege and class, and in many ways remains so today. I've come to a private soiree of Indian classical music. This is a pretty high-end kind of area, and I know that there are going to be so many connoisseurs of music. It's invites only, so I thought, you know what, I'd better dress up. Tonight, I'm rubbing shoulders with some of the cultural elites of the city. There are two great schools of Indian classical music, 
Hindustani from the north and Carnatic from the south. This is Hindustani style, the one I belong to. This is what a typical Indian classical concert looks like. It's pretty serious at the beginning. It's restrained, people are listening. There's a meditative element uh, to it. There's the, the, the string player creates a sort of ambience that envelops the whole audience. And then the tabla player joins in and it gets pretty lively. Tonight's performance features a romantic rag, usually played late at night. The form of Indian classical music is to have a main melody player, and in this case, it's a sarod. And basically, he improvises on the rag, and he has a accompanist on the tabla who sort of provides the rhythm cycle, and together they make the concert. Pratush, the Sarod player, knows that you know the audience is filled with connoisseurs, music lovers, and he's playing certain phrases, certain rhythmical uh, ideas that he might not play anywhere else, but this audience gets it, and they're really riffing off each other. So it's 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 sort of spine tingling to watch. like the Western music where it's a set piece yeah. and it's a written script and you follow. It's just spontaneous and it comes from the heart. I think it's this thing about you know how it captures space and time and moods and seasons. The here and now but also the timeless. We talk about the raga. The raga is sleeping within you. The artist is wicked. That's a bit that everyone waits for at the end. There's this huge climax and People are left in this sort of like ecstasy, you know, the tabla player is going for it, the sarod player is going for it, and bang, there's the ending. And people get this sense of release that they've been waiting for. And that's the, that's the form. You wait a long time to get to that point, and when you do feel that release, oh. Come on! To make it in the Indian classical world, you need a good teacher. But it's much more than your average music education. Here, you're part of ancient rituals of learning, in which your bond with your musical guru is deep and personal. Tucked away in the back streets of Kolkata is the house where my guru, Pandit Buddhadev Das Gupta, used to live. I've been coming here for over 20 years now, you know take off my shoes, go inside, sit at his feet and learn how to play. Sadly, he's not around anymore, but there's music coming out of the house and that's because they still one, teach him. One, two, three, four. Since the death of my guru, Pratush has taken on the mantle of teaching the next generation. One, two, stop. Instruction is through oral transmission, with nothing written down. One, two, three, four. It requires years of patiently absorbing the teaching. One, two. It is not about knowing, it's about immersing yourself into that and letting the music immerse you. It's a difficult instrument. It's a, it's a classical instrument. Why, why do you want to learn this? When I play this, even if I'm stressed, if I'm angry, if I'm sad for anything, it just clears everything from my mind. 
What shaped Hindustani classical music more than anything else was the Mughal invasion from Afghanistan in the 16th century. The Mughals went on to rule much of India for 300 years. They were passionate about the arts and at their palaces and courts became patrons of musicians fusing Indian music with their own traditions. During that long Muslim uh, rule and in the Mughal period, even in the post-Mughal period, we had many, many Muslim musicians who were the real representatives of this music. Do you think this was a conscious decision that they brought their music as a sort of way of colonizing and a way of conquering? They did not bring this music. The music was already there. Mm -hmm. They mastered it. The music was India's own. They just developed it. I was only 13 years old when I started to learn from my guru. Every winter I'd spend a month just staying with him, absorbing the music. In some ways I was lucky to live in London because I was half in and half out of the pure classical world. It was a lot harder for the students who lived in India. The talent sometimes isn't enough to give you the big break that you want. And like Indian society in general, it helps to have connections, uh, patrons, perhaps a prestigious lineage uh, to help you climb the hierarchy of the classical music world. One man who got to the very top of the classical music world was Pandit Ravi Shankar, who came from an upper caste family of Bengali barristers. He played the sitar, the other great instrument of Hindustani music, and in the West became the most celebrated of all Indian musicians. But Ravi Shankar wasn't the only Bengali sitarist. He had a great rival, Ustad Vilayat Khan, who had a musical lineage that went back five generations. His son, Shajat, now carries that torch. You have such a unique voice on this instrument. Uh, <laughs> I think we worked many years to, to, to develop that. Uh, I can to, imagine. Especially when you come from a very, very strong, big lineage. It's a picture of me when I'm very young. Uh -huh. And this is my first sitar. Oh my goodness, uh, how old were you here? I think, I think I'm four. I was practicing already and uh, getting ready for my first concert, which was uh, when I was six. And this is what Indian classical music is all about. Being born into a family, you're born into sounds that you're constantly hearing. So by the time you're six, you have thousands of hours of listening and practice behind you. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Oh my goodness. It's my father. What was he like as a teacher? Very strict. Very strict. Very demanding. They didn't give you an explanation. How does this work? Practice. What should I do? Practice. How will this get better? Practice. So there was that standard answer. You see that? So. Shajat's father, Vilayat Khan, was not just part of a long lineage, he was an innovator. He famously created a style of playing known as the gayaki, or vocal style, where the sitar closely mimics the sound of the human voice.
So we... I don't know who's singing, your sitar or you. It's, <laughs> it's like... A, that, that's what we try. It's an extension of your voice. To succeed in the world of Indian classical music, do you need to have a personality that's larger than life? Do you need to be a diva? <laughs> uh, uh, I think it, it comes naturally in any profession when uh, you work really hard to get to a certain position. I think I am getting there. I'm, I'm a bit of, <laughs> bit of a diva sometimes. <laughs> Every diva needs a supporting artist. In Hindustani music, that role falls to the tabla player. The story of the tabla reflects the many divisions within Indian society and how caste and religion became entwined with music. This city is home to some of the best tabla players in the world. And the guy I'm going to meet now he used to be the main tabla player for the legendary Pandit Ravi Shankar himself. His name is Bikram Kosh, and he's one of today's many higher caste Hindu tabla players. Traditionally, this drum was only played by Muslim men or those of lower castes, who were the only ones allowed to touch the animal skin covering the drum. Lovely sweet sir, pore. Dandik nitave. Bikram is an old friend, but I still can't remember exactly where he lives. I know this house, I've been here so many times, but it's just new buildings everywhere, construction, I, I don't recognize this place anymore. He says this way. Bye, Shonali Park. Show me. How are you? How are you? Good well, to see come you. on in. Thanks. Come on in. The tabla goes uh, back a few centuries. There's very little written because the, the people who used to play the music were not educated. They wouldn't write things down. Yeah. They were often sitting on the edge of society. All right. So traditionally, was there a hierarchy in the musical system? Yes, absolutely. And. Uh, that's where a lot of our troubles stem from. Okay. <laughs> but there, there was definitely a hierarchy. Okay, now I'm curious. So, so the, the vocalist was considered the top person in the business. Mm -hmm. Then came the instrumentalist, the string instrumentalist, the sitar, or the sarod, which is what you play. And then the skin uh, players, the mm. skin drummers, mm. were considered lower down in the food chain of hierarchy. I mean, so if it's about animal skin, then these players couldn't have been Hindus. Well, many of them were Muslims. Mm. So there are photographs of uh, the tabla player standing and in a performance with a kamarband, which means basically a, a big cloth which ties the tabla to your waist right. and standing and performing because they didn't have permission to sit. It's only been in recent decades that there's been a loosening of these strict cultural rules and higher caste Hindus like Bikram have taken to mastering this instrument. In Indian music, the vocalist often remains in an exalted position, at the top of the classical hierarchy. Koshiki Chakrabarti is one of the very best. I've asked to meet her on the steps of the Ganges in Kolkata. She performs a vocal style known as khayal which translates as imagination in Arabic. It's a style that fuses Hindu and Muslim cultural traditions. I've got goose flesh. Look, 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 seriously, look at that. Seriously. That's, oh my God. Yeah, it's just one just of the most lovely uh, rugs that I have ever heard and performed. And I think every time I perform this, I, I become too emotional, so I have to tell myself I'm performing. 
can you explain to me what the four lines actually mean? I think I'm so inspired by this place. So I'm singing a song which is so much about a scene like this. The composition says, Neer bharane nikasi. Neer is water. Bharane is to fill. Nikasi is I'm going. So it says that Radha, you know, she's going to fetch water. And on my way, Krishna is coming and stopping me on every step. So I'm telling a story which is hundreds and hundreds of years old. So how do I tell that story every time in a new way? So sometimes I say, Some other time I'll say, You can say uh, it in a different way every time, keeping the words same. That's the only thing because it's a composition, so you can't bring in new words. What I'm confused about is that like Krishna being a Hindu god mm -hmm. and this music being sort of inspired by, well, Persian music, and that's where it came from. Yeah, you know, yeah. The roots of Indian the classical music. Silk roots, yeah. The Silk Road. Yeah. And yet so many of the songs and lyrics are about Krishna. I think this idea of a Hindu God's praise sung in a Muslim traditional form of music is our division. So we don't know how people thought at that time. Maybe they never thought of a Hindu God or a Muslim form of music. Maybe they didn't have this division in their minds. You're saying it was it one was of all the same? same? I'm an instrumentalist. What we're trying to do is really emulate the singer. I wonder if we can just try a few phrases yeah, and sure. maybe I'll. I don't know if I can, but I'm of trying. course, yeah, Hoping sure. Da 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 da. It becomes a playful game called a jugglebandi for the vocalist to make yet more complex improvisations around the rug, which I have to attempt to emulate. <laughs> So much fun. <laughs> this is can, for you. This can go on and on and on and on. <laughs> Is this music a form of entertainment? The subtlety, the calmness, the introspection is an essential part of this music. You need to connect with yourself, with the inner silence or if there's sound within. So is it for a mass audience to come and take this journey with this music as, you know, as a part of entertainment? I would say no. But this music, I believe, is extremely powerful and if, if allowed, it can take the most beautiful spot in your heart. That was such an amazing experience. And it reminds me that songs like this would have been performed in Mughal palaces and on riverbanks. But back then, they didn't define them as Hindu or Muslim music. It was simply about connecting to nature and the divine. It points to the, the sacred origins of classical music. Five hundred miles to the west of Kolkata is Varanasi, one of the oldest and most sacred cities in India. It's where I've come next to really get a sense of the spiritual dimension of classical music. The river Ganges holds deep significance for all Hindus. Mm -hmm. 
Every evening, on the banks of the river, Hindu priests perform a choreographed ritual where musical sounds form an essential part of the ceremony. All these people have gathered here to witness this ritual. You know, lamps are lit, flowers everywhere, and the priests are reciting this ancient mantra. I, I don't know what it is, presumably in Sanskrit, but you can't help but feel that there is the sacredness of sound that takes over the entire riverbank. The ritual points to something really important about how, in India, musical sounds are seen as holding divine power. The penetrating conch shell and the resonance of the bells are such sounds. Most Hindus will have a conch shell or a temple bell, you know, in their homes. And it, sh it sort of shows that sound itself, these instruments of sound, are considered sacred. Indian classical music stems from these beliefs that there is cosmic power inherent in certain sounds. And those spiritual beliefs remain fundamental to classical music today. The links between classical music and ancient Hindu traditions are even more evident when you travel to the far south of the country. At the foot of India is the historic state of Tamil Nadu, which is where I'm heading next. This is its capital, Madras, known now as Chennai. More than anywhere else, this is the part of India untouched by the Mughal conquest, where the rhythms of daily life and traditional culture are very different to those of the north. It's famous for its huge towering temples and for being home to India's other great school of classical music, which has its own rags played on completely different instruments. Chennai is the center of Carnatic music, which is a very different form of classical music than the one I studied and grew up with. Here you can find traditional music being played at scores of neighborhood temples like this one, linked to Hindu devotional practices as it has been for hundreds of years. The conch shell and the huge drum are a salutation to the gods as morning worship begins. Feel it in the belly. That was so loud. It's like they're really reaching somewhere else with that sound. And there's an exuberant group of temple musicians playing Karnatak rags to accompany the daily rituals. The resonant sound of the Nagaswaram and the Tavil drum are considered to have that same divine power, deeply auspicious for all Hindu ceremonies. That is so powerful. The music that you played, is this Karnataka classical music? Karnataka classical music. The Ragam Mandu Gambira Nate. Okay. 
I can recognize all these intricate rhythms and melodies from the Carnatic music tradition, but when it's all played here in this temple, the effect is completely different. It's as though it's coming from the belly with raw power. What's striking to me here is the link between Carnatic classical music and the devotional practices of the temple. And this music has been part of their daily lives for hundreds of years. These days, temple musicians aren't the only ones who play Carnatic music. I'm on my way to meet one of the current stars of this music at her home as she prepares for a concert performance. Like many top musicians, she comes from the elite Brahmin caste, who were traditionally the priests in Hinduism. One of the most ancient instruments of the Carnatic music tradition is the veena. It's just funny to be here at this super fancy, modern looking building to hear it. Hello, Hello. Namaste. 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 Welcome. How Looking are you? Fantastic. Well, wow, I love Thank that. You. Sorry. I'll show you this place where I have all my veenas, my practice room, and where I teach. It's veena paradise. <laughs> Jayanti Kumaresh plays the main string instrument of Carnatic music, the Saraswati veena. This ancient instrument is as important to Carnatic music as the sitar or sarod to the classical music of the north. Music is so connected to spirituality. So I like to do a little prayer here. Among the images on her shrine at morning prayer is one of Saraswati, the Hindu goddess of learning. Is this Saraswati? This is goddess Saraswati. Ah, so this is the goddess that your instrument is yeah, named after. exactly. So, and yeah. that's the veena in her hand. Yes. In every Brahminical household, the sister, the mother, the son, somebody learns Carnatic music. You, you will find a veena in almost every Brahmin's house. So it is very important for them to be, um, to give importance to fine arts. It's a way of life. <laughs> The unique rags of Carnatic music have a different sound to that of Hindustani music. And the veena is used to play notes in a very different way from the sitar or the sarod. How ancient is this instrument? I would say from the Vedic times, over 2,000 years old, it has been changing in shape, size, structure. You know, the first ever veena was made using a human skull as a resonator and a bamboo stick for this. And the nose in the skull was the bridge. Luckily, they changed the design. Yeah, and I'm playing on something that looks pretty now. <laughs> what I'd love to know is, what is the difference between Carnatic music and Hindustani, North Indian classical music? Initially, the entire India had one system of music. And later, you had the Mughal, Persian and Afghan invasion, mm. more in the north. Mm. Which is why the content essentially changed between the south of India and the north of India. In the south of India, we have quite a lot of compositions. So we do have a great amount of improvisation also. Is Carnatic music more devotional? I wouldn't call it devotional as in uh, like prayer songs. Mm. It is totally art music, but quite a lot. I would say at least 60 to 70 percent of the content are addressed to the Divine Supreme. <laughs> To really get a feel for her music, Jayanti has invited me to hear her play. Oh, that's divine. 
you know, all the rhythmic interplay, the, the microtones, and just the sound of the vena is so evocative. I love the fact that today Jayanthi has been joined by her husband, Kumaresh, who's on that most Western of instruments, the violin. One of the unlikely legacies of British colonial rule is that Carnatic music has adopted this instrument. But it's tuned differently and played in its own way to suit this ancient music. These days, the world of Carnatic music is not just deeply traditional, it's also very conservative. Once a year, at the Mammoth Madras Music Festival, a bit like the proms, the city's cultural elite gather to hear the best of Carnatic music. At the center is the revered Madras Music Academy, which is where every Carnatic musician aspires to play. <laughs> Today's headliners are the Trichur brothers performing vocal music. Compared to the Hindustani tradition, Karnatak music has many more vocal concerts. Is it a largely vocal style of music? It is. This is a vocal music dominated art. And even the instrumentalists, when they take to performing, their, their ultimate aim is to ensure that the music is as close to vocal music as possible. Traditional music like this in both North and South India was only given the label of being classical in the last century. It was a label that gave prestige to this music during the era when Indian nationalists battled against the British for independence. Several of the freedom fighters were on the board of the Music Academy. We had this uh, prominent freedom fighter, Tatyamurti. He was really instrumental in getting artists involved in the freedom movement. And from then on, musicians began singing songs, praising freedom fighters, praising Gandhi. For instance, our Gandhi has gone to London Raise your hands in salutations and pray to him. What is this? A song? This is a song. It's a Gandhi a song. London po nar kai kupi toruvir. That is how the song wow. goes. And when would these have been sung? You know? Suddenly, without warning, they'll sing it in the middle of a concert. Just to get the public woken up about the freedom struggle. And there are, for instance, songs written in English for the benefit of people who didn't know Tamil. For instance, this is the occasion for our liberation. This Congress resolution, Gandhi's inspiration. Mm, this is the occasion for liberation. But despite its former provocations, the world of Carnatic music, like much of Indian society, is now much less radical. Do you think the community here is very precious about about the form and keeping it authentic. We are very strict about what can go on as performance under the auspices of the Music Academy. Right. There are certain instruments that you can't use for instance, in the Music Academy. The harmonium, for instance, cannot be used here. The musicians have to be dressed in the traditional style when they come to perform here. And there is a lot of struggle if a musician tries to break out of the, uh, you know, the uh, bounds of uh, Carnatic classical music and tries anything new. If something is tried, it takes a long while for it to be accepted. Mm. Wow! Earth and clay pots. One of the instruments that's had to battle hard to get accepted into the classical world is a traditional drum known as a guttam. This is a... Um, this, this is a guttam. Guttam. The guttam is basically a giant clay pot, a bit like these ones sold by the roadside. 
drive. Ah, okay. Unfortunately, I don't speak Tamil, and I'm not sure these pots are quite what I'm looking for. What's the difference between this and a katam? Nothing. Dry means soft and cut. Oh, it needs to be dry. Yeah, dry. That's what it is. And these are out on the street, it's been raining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I see. Guttams have been played for nearly 2,000 years in Indian music, but have only been accepted as a classical instrument for just over a century. I love the guttam, the sound of it. In the hands of an expert, a guttam creates incredible rhythms. But what's still not acceptable is for a woman to play this instrument. Sukanya is the first female to professionally take up the gutam. And I'd love to jam with her. Hi, Sukanya ji. Hi, please. It's Shomik. Yeah, hello. <laughs> Sorry to disturb your no, practice. No. Namaste. 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 I'm Shomik. What I'd love to know is what is the difference between this gutam and the water pot? Ah, right. See the difference. The, the, the quality of the, this stone and this stone. That is just ordinary mud pot. Musical katams have traditionally been made by just one family in one village called Manamadurai, 50 miles from Chennai. The clay available near the river bed contains iron and some minerals. And they are adding some more uh, uh, fine metallic powder and a secret powder because only known to their family. <laughs> oh, wow, really? Yeah. This is a wonderful chance for me to play with a guttam. The trouble is, Sukanya and I come from two very different classical traditions. I think I'm gonna maybe choose a, a rag that is common to both the north and the south. This is a bit of an experiment. like being a woman playing this yeah I'm, in a man's the, I'm the first lady to come up with the gatam a gatam playing uh, by a woman is new to everyone right. because I'm the first one to take it as a profession has there ever been a case where you haven't been allowed to play somewhere or yeah yeah it's a, it was a music festival in Bangalore so I went for my concert to accompany a legendary artist I was stopped the, at the entrance itself by the secretary. So he said, I'm very sorry, Sukanya. I didn't expect this, but uh, the artist doesn't want to play with you. I have to come back to my house. That day I cried a lot because what is this? I have, I am also practiced for so many years and uh, uh, with passion I'm playing uh, this instrument. Why there is gender bias? Why there is caste-based things? Why religion-based? Music for everybody. That's what my thought. <laughs> and now, today, is it still tough to be a woman in this world? Yeah, that is why I'm the only lady playing on the gadam. Because no opportunities. So it's still continuing. A few miles from the Madras Music Academy is the Fisherman's Beach in Chennai. Home to a radical attempt to shake up the conservatism of the classical music world. At an annual alternative music festival, 
Classical artists like the renowned Karnatic vocalist T.M. Krishna share a stage with artists from different castes, social backgrounds and musical styles. People who are usually barred from the established classical world. The idea is artist public, art should be for the public, by the public and supported by people. It belongs to everybody. T.M. Krishna believes that classical music has become isolated and is now the preserve of the Hindu Brahmin elite. What are your thoughts on the notion of classical music? Do you find it restrictive? The word classical is bunkum. It's absolute bunkum. It's a socio-political concept. And any art form that is controlled and appreciated by the social cultural elite of any part of the world is called classical. I can show you in India art forms in the world of music or world of theater which don't get the tag of classical simply because they are practiced by people who are deemed lower caste. So the next composition is a prayer to Allah in a church performed by a collection of Hindus. More controversial was Krishna's performance of Karnatic music in a Mumbai church that celebrated the gods of other faiths. So when I sang in church, I have been accused of converting to Christianity, aiding and abetting evangelists, anti-Hindu, anti-Indian culture, uh, you know, polluting the sanctified art of Carnatic music with singing hymns on Jesus, on Allah. If somebody has a problem with me singing on, on Christ, uh, that means they have a political position on the music already, which is it's Hindu music, it's therefore propagating Hinduism. And I fundamentally disagree with that. In an era when Hindu nationalists are in power in India, TM Krishna is rocking the boat, creating waves not just in the arts world. Famed Carnatic singer TM Krishna's concert, which was scheduled to be held in the national capital, has allegedly been called off after a troll campaign by the right wing. It seems like there is this group of uh, gundas and these you know, mafias that get together and come together and put this pressure. They threatened a march. They, apparently somebody threatened that he'll bring a gun or something. So it's not fun, by the way. I mean, uh, this is not fun. I mean, you just want to go and sing. <laughs> I find T.M. Krishna's unapologetic attitude and singular determination really inspiring. He's calling for a democratization of this music, to make it truly music for all people. And in doing so, he's highlighting some of the clashes and divisions that mark Indian society. My final stop is 200 miles west of Chennai, in the modern city of Bengaluru, where changes are underway. Here, younger musicians are pushing the boundaries of classical music. They're taking traditional forms to new audiences and throwing out the rulebook for how this music should be performed. I've come to the edge of the city to a private rehearsal room for an upcoming band called Agam, who are really pushing the boundaries of Carnatic music by mixing it with metal. Fronted by a classically trained vocalist, Agam perform their own guitar rock versions of traditional Carnatic compositions that are hundreds of years old.
are they destroying the original Carnatic music? Yeah. No, definitely no. They're adding essence. What is Carnatic? We are made of that because we are from here. Right. But we also want to listen to rock, heavy metal. And when both are blended together, you know, it's something amazing. So would you go to listen to Carnatic music in a traditional setting? With parents. <laughs> With parents? <laughs> when I uh, made my teacher, who's uh, 85 years, listen to what Agam is playing, she's like, wow, this is also nice. And she was stunned, actually, she was stunned. Because, because of the feel of the music, the way they sing it, because of the whole arrangement of the instruments, you know, you know they take a music and they make it understandable for the whole world. such a blend of like styles the indian carnatic layer is right up there that's your that's your yeah, voice yeah, yeah. you know and it's soaring it's just beautiful and people are just loving that sound extreme conservative people are like you cannot do it this way but we don't play by the rules of carnatic music we try to keep it close so that it doesn't feel uh, too out there Ours is a premeditated effort, so we mix ragas not unknowingly. So all the odd notes that we throw in are all planned. They're not so, mistakes. So, no, they're not mistakes. So I mean, it's it's not that we don't get it. So we completely get it. We'll still do it. <laughs> These melodies and these words are such well-known classical compositions that their fans know every word. And I love it that they've torn apart the rule book. They're having fun and they've created something that works. So many people who are like, well, classical music is tradition. Yep, yep. But then there's this other school of thought, which is if it doesn't evolve, then it won't. Yeah, survive. Yeah. Any new experiment is bound to get some amount of pushback. People like the fact that it could be done this way. And, and that whole uh, shaking out of the mold. Traveling around this vast country, it's great to see how this complex and sophisticated art form that I love explains much about what has shaped this nation. Despite being hundreds of years old, I think it's great that Indian classical music is still evolving and still causing controversies. It's not a dead tradition, it's alive today, and it tells me that these ancient melodies are as relevant as they've ever been. In the next episode, I'm going to explore the traditional music of ordinary people and the extraordinary diversity of India's folk and devotional music to find out what this can tell us about how India is changing. And Rhythms of India, Music of the People continues at the same time, 1am tomorrow. Stay with us for the ideas that shape the modern world from afar. Geniuses of the ancient world focuses on Socrates next. <laughs>